Hey, how is everybody? I fancy streaming something, so yeah, naval action. I thought, why not? Because last time I streamed, we had a go at GTA 5 and then it turned into warships because GTA wasn't working very well. I'm also going to have to do the terribly unprofessional thing of uh, using monitor capture because the game window capture just does not pick up naval action at all. I don't know why. Anyway, this is uh, PvP 1. And I'm actually on PvP 1 for a change rather than PvP 3, which is basically a clone of PvP 1. I I still have the basic cutter, don't I? Uh, yeah, let's just let's just see where I am. I can't remember exactly. I think last time I was playing this, it was either with uh, Ginge or Hildebrandt. It was probably Hildebrandt, actually. Um, but yeah, we were sailing around and just... Yeah, as you can see, I still have the basic cutter. This is one of the reasons why I haven't done a video on naval action yet, because I'm still at the very early stages of grinding through stuff. In fact, if I go into Beaufort... Um, or just take a mission. We'll just take a mission, I think. That'll be the quickest way to go and find a, a fight. So I'll take a midshipman mission, which will give me 5,000 gold and uh, 50 XP. And as you can see, I'm halfway to junior lieutenant at the moment. So there we go. Search and destroy near Beaufort. So we'll Your sail. Your business is appreciated. Thanks for the follow, Zane Tillies, I think that is supposed to be. There was another follow while we were having some sea shanties as well, but I didn't catch that in there, unfortunately. So let's have a quick look at the, the world map as well, because this has probably changed quite a lot since the last time I looked. Um, yeah, the Royal Navy's been going ham on uh, Central America. Look at that. And this is, uh, now, this is all fully live. Um, and good grief, no, we now have the United States, I'm in the United States uh, faction, now basically has all of um, Texas and Spain's been squashed right back to coast of Mexico and it looks like the south coast of Cuba and whichever island that is so yeah Spain has been pushed right back um, last time I logged in this was more or less the same as well the Dutch have basically uh, the whole coast of um, Guyana and is that Venezuela I can never remember uh, there's a bit of French presence over here this this is interesting um, the French have managed to hold on to all these islands here because the the Danes was it the Danes yeah Denmark Norway were going ham Denmark Norway had taken over a huge amount but Denmark Norway have been pushed back it looks like and Sweden's actually uh, managed to carve out a group of uh, islands for themselves there as well so yeah the starting map uh, was completely different than this and this is one of the it's almost like um, Oh, what's the name of that game? Planet Side 2, where there's that persistent open world and it's just going back and forth between the different factions. Except in Planet Side 2, there's only two factions. And you can see how many factions there are in this game. Now, neutral, uh, I think I don't think neutral ports can, I don't think ports can be flipped to be neutral. So maybe eventually there will be no neutral ports, I don't know. Or maybe there are certain ways in which ports can become neutral. But we've got Spain, Britain, Denmark, Norway, the US, the Pirates who can take over stuff. This all here, the Palmas, seems to largely be pirate territory now. In fact, they've got some ports on the north coast of uh, uh, north coast of Cuba as well. France, the Dutch, and Sweden. And there's also free towns, which are not the same as, as uh, neutral ports. I'm not sure what the exact distinction between a neutral port and a free town is. Uh, maybe free towns are more hospitable towards pirates, I'm not sure. But when you can also have actual pirate faction ports. Yeah, I, I'm not sure of some of the exact mechanics yet. And that's another reason why I've not really done a lot of um, uh, videos yet. Because uh, there's still a lot of stuff. That, like the fighting, I know about. But the rest of it is... Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that are not familiar yet. So, we're at Beaufort. There's Beaufort. So, it's a little two hours south. So yeah, the, it's it's interesting just to spend a couple of minutes looking around the world map every time I, I log in. And of course it's different between the different server shards. So it's going to be different on the, the US server and it's going to be different on the uh, the PvP. Uh, yes, PvE rather. You had the... Uh, y your school's closed today. Hey Chaser. Interesting. Is it bad weather? We've actually got some... Uh, with, you can hear maybe the wind whistling through the rigging or, well, my chimney. So uh, I'm 
I'm actually doing this in lieu of um, sitting down and recording uh, the next of my uh, my, my uh, Patreon supporter week videos because uh, it's it's going to be a bit noisy in the microphone. It's not quite as bad as last time when we had what was it Storm Imogen and uh, it was just impossible to record because it was just too loud. It was it was actually. I'm, I was going to have to shout over the noise, practically. <laughs> Maybe not quite that bad, but it would have been really audible in the background. And it's, if, it's, if it stays at the current state, it's going to be quite audible. Now, is this the instance? Yes, here we go. That's the instance we're after. So, yeah. This is also shaping up to be a night fight, so that could be interesting. But yeah, I'm hoping the wind dies down a bit, because uh, then I can record. And I'm actually really hoping to record some CK2 today as well. But again, we need the wind to die down a bit. So it's probably gusting over 50 easily today. And in theory, I need to go down to the shops. But that's quite a long walk, and I don't much fancy walking in wind carrying bags of shopping. My business is appreciated. So. Anyway, thanks for the follow, Viklas the Mad. There's the name. So this is going to be an enemy cutter or privateer or brig. It'll be a, a, an AI pirate, basically. It rained and then froze over. Ah, okay. Right. Here we go. Let's have a fight. Let's grind some XP. Well, bear in mind, Brett, this is all open world. Uh, everything in the open world moves faster, basically, and much more unrealistically. You don't have to worry about the wind nearly so much in the open world. Whereas once you get into a battle instance, that's when the kind of the full range of physics takes over. So here we are. That is an enemy something. I can't quite see yet. It won't let me use my uh, telescope for another 10 seconds. Now, there's actually the next patch of this. I've, I've been reading up. They've started putting up, hopefully, what will become regular kind of dev blog things on Steam. And that's one thing the developers have been relatively bad at, is um, laying out that sort of thing. They do have an official blog on their website, but they were posting stuff every couple of months. And their Twitter and Facebook feeds tend to mostly be, um, you know, commemorating, you know, on this day in, in 1769, the Battle of whatever was fought and that kind of thing. So the actual information coming out of the devs has been a little bit on the sparse side, but uh, hopefully that picks up. But yeah, there's some very interesting changes coming up. Um, as regards crew, as regards the way uh, this whole um, focus system works, as regards what losing crew means for your gunnery and sailing and all that kind of thing. So yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, and it'll have some interesting implications. So. Uh, Having, I mean, having crew knocked out, for instance, won't globally affect your guns. It will now be calculated on a per gun basis as to where the crew's been knocked out. So that's interesting. It's obviously going to split each ship into different kind of crew zones rather than just have the whole ship be a homogenous zone, as it were. So anyway, the cutter. It's like all of the small kind of uh, ships. You can just throw it around the ocean pretty much really nearly. I do now have enough gold and whatever to get the yacht fitted out but um, I've already got a yacht that's up in Charleston so I'd need to I could fast travel to Charleston which you can do once a day but then I'd have to sail all the way back down to where I am so I might do that at some point but that's that's when I've got like a couple of hours spare where I'm not doing a lot else and I think for the time being, it's probably just worth sticking with a cutter anyway, because it's the cutter is basically your T1 Cunningham or your your LOL tractor or your MS1. It's your ship that you can like. If you lose every other ship, if you lose all your money, you get reduced to complete penury. You'll always have a cutter available. Basically, you'll never not have a cutter. So it's impossible to get so stuck that you just completely run out of cash. Basically. I am flying the US Ensign, I am indeed. I, I picked an American character this time around. This is the third time we've created characters over, but they've said at this point there are going to be no more wipes. 
uh, and initially, uh, at least when I created this, uh, I think they restricted it to one character um, per server. And if you go on, it's like the same same character. But I think they may have lifted that now. I think it might be possible to have more than one character. So uh, it's it's an interesting mix, though. I mean, um, I, I previously created a Dutch captain. And they were mostly English speakers, although I think there were some actual Dutch people playing that faction. Um, the time before that was a Royal Navy captain, and they seemed to largely be Brits, although not entirely. And the US, at least on the EU server, well obviously the US faction on the US server is going to be largely Americans. But um, it's uh, a bit mixed. It's a real mix of nationalities. And I think there will be some actual Americans playing over on the EU server, but there'll also be, uh, you know, people just wanting to try different things. And when you start off, I mean, the starting map was very, um, like the US starts right up on the, I don't even know what coast it would be, Carolinas, it's kind of the, the Louisiana maybe, no, in fact, Louisiana is French at that point. Uh, that, that's kind of um, the furthest up, or first, furthest down ports you have, which is, well away from the rest of the Caribbean and I'm still I'm not even down towards Florida yet which is why I'm hesitating about going back to Charleston um, but at this point they've conquered pretty much all of the Florida ports they've conquered all the, the kind of Texas ports so um, it's probably less hard starting as the US these days although because Charleston is the primary port you've still got a hell of a long sail to, to get anywhere when you're starting out but in a way, that's not bad. That gives you, um, you've got time to sail down. You can take these Admiralty orders. You can grind your XP and, and, and unlock bigger crews and then uh, do some you know, trading and some crafting along the way. And then you get down to the Caribbean, which is where all the action is taking place. Whereas if you start with one of the other factions, um, you might just be being thrust into action right away, especially on the PVP server. Because uh, PvP, of course, um, players can attack each other. And that's less likely to happen when you're starting all the way up in US waters. Because nobody else has any ports up here. So we're just going to keep hammering this enemy. What is it? Oh, the wrong way. This is a privateer, I think. We're just circling each other. The kind of the. These. I always want to say low tier. <laughs> These low-tier one-on-one battles, I mean, you're just basically circling around each other, hammering away. But what gets more interesting is when you have several small ships t trying to take down some of the um, slightly larger ships, like Snows and um, uh, Briggs. And then life gets a little more interesting. I think I'd be a bit more tactical. We might also see if we can find some contraband carrying traders, because they tend to be not oh, nearly as well gunned. I've got to be careful of my armour here. It's definitely worth manoeuvring if you know somebody's lining up to uh, shoot. And the AI, I have noticed the AI likes to, as often as possible, turn and use all its cannons, so you can use that against the AI. We also have to be wary of getting uh, broadsides. So you have to try and use the uh, the wind to your advantage. So it's going to be loaded soon. We'll make a little turn here, make his shot a bit harder. So, naval action. Naval action might be a thing that only appears on streams for the next little while. Uh, it, it's it depends. Because I don't that often have the, the kind of time to sit down and play for... Because you need really at least two hours, two, maybe even three hours to, to really get the most out of a session. Because you spend so long just sailing around. And doing that for a YouTube video, I, I'd have to spend a couple of hours at it and then just cut out a lot, basically. Right, we're getting pretty hammered on the starboard armour. So we're going to try and uh, bring our port side to bear for a while. But I'm also hammering his uh, port armor. Also, sorry I'm not keeping an eye on the chat that much. I can't even type into the, the, the chat, because if you 
click outside the game window. I might inadvertently click outside the game window at various points because uh, naval action does not constrain the mouse to the game window yet. That's one of the, the slightly annoying bugbears that's been the case for a while. Now he's actually now turning, so he'll be presenting his stronger armor, really. I still have a repair available. I don't think the AI can use repairs. Well, here we go. This is the side of this ship we want. This is slightly tricky to see. Oh, yeah, that was a hit. That was a hit. No, just whiffed over. I was trying to imagine how World of Warships players would cope with these kind of sea conditions. And you can have a full-on storm fights as well. You can fight inside a storm, which is not really a good idea. But I remember when they introduced the storm map in the sea trials. And a lot of people were just... They just hated it because, of course, it, would, it, it was just a random map drop. Whereas, of course, in the open world, you can choose to avoid <laughs> to fight in a storm. Uh, because obviously, you know, you can look at the weather and you can see, oh, that's a storm. I can't tell if it's hitting a lot. And you can uh, do your best to avoid it. Right, so I've got my stronger armor. Um, the, the side where I have more armor. And, oh, he's trying to turn there. And uh, we're almost dead in the wind right now, so let's turn ourselves. Because we're in a cutter, you can just throw it around. It's the same with the yachts, it's the same with the privateers. When you get, however, to later to the multi-masted ships, uh, you have to manage your sails a lot more carefully. Right, I'm going to wait, maybe, until he... flips around again. Let's turn back through the wind. Yeah, there's no... Yeah, there is no active wave system. I was, but I was just... I was having fun imagining what it would be like, how, how salty people would get if you had that level of um, like ocean activity in World of Warships. Because of course it, it would be like the sea trials, it would just be an unavoidable random drop as it were. Just keep hammering him. We'll use the repair very soon I think. But we might as well come about Use our other guns. I seem to be. Have I lost enough crew that. No? Boom, 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 there we go. I actually upgraded the guns on this, so you start off with four pounder cannons. And then you end up with. Um, I think on this you can have up to six pounders. That's actually, by the way, where the whole British. Like, it, it, for World of Tanks. That's why, uh, for that era, uh, we um, named our ammo after the weight of the shell. And it, it, stay, it basically all goes back to um, the days of, of cannibals and naval cannons. Because it was the weight of the, the cannons that you named the, uh, you know, the guns by. And so they continued that with uh, tank guns and anti-tank guns. Oh, that was probably too high. We've almost got one of his uh, sides down there. That's his port side, isn't it? Which I think is the side I'm facing right now. So we can just... A couple more salvos. A couple more volleys. So yeah, even in... Uh, even up to World War Two, you know, those old uh, Royal Navy traditions were still... That, that was the reason why we had 32-pounders and 17-pounders and 25-pounders and 6-pounders and 2-pounders. It's all back to this era. Nearly done with this guy. Oh, he's coming awfully close. Come on. Go, 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 go. Right, that is one side completely gone. He should now start taking water. 
and it, at this point it's just a matter of being patient. It's a very nice looking game. This. Hopefully the frame rate's keeping up on uh, on OBS. Should be. I don't think it's a particularly processor intensive game. And although the effects are nice, it's not like it's uh, it's not going to tax my pretty good graphics card, surely. Hey, Sombra. Who else is around? Nikos, German somebody. So, I mean, I could try and... I, I could... Ha having said, I think that you can now have multiple characters. I could try and create, you know, a Royal Navy character or a... Or a Dutch character. A Royal Navy? You know, a British character. But um, I think we'll stick with US for now, because I don't want to divide my time between multiple characters when I'm already not having that much time to spend on the game. I might as well just put the time into one character, build up the XP and whatever. And then we can go around liberating the Caribbean in the name of freedom. Because they might have oil. Yeah. Whale oil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've got to go liberate that there, whale oil. Let's turn back through the wind. He should be he should be going down, is he actually? How's he looking? He should be starting to sit lower in the water. It does also matter, by the way, um, where you hit an enemy. So if you get waterline hits, and you want waterline hits, uh, that basically gives a much higher chance of the enemy even if they even if they still have armor you can get somebody to spring a leak and the, the enemy crew then has to deal with that leak so it is definitely worth getting uh, there we go yeah he is starting to sit low in the water to get waterline hits because it uh, forces the enemy to change their crew focus make their guns less effective make their sailing less effective although that's not going to be yeah like I said at the start that's this entire system is going to work differently. The focus system. It's not going to be quite all as all, uh, as all or nothing. In fact, my reading of it sounds uh, it sounds like a lot more like it's going to be how it is in Elite Dangerous, when you actually um, you have kind of like three areas of focus. You've got like weapons, uh, shields, and engines, I think, and you kind of. You have a certain amount of energy and then you split it between the three, depending on which focus you want at any one time. So you might have all of the energy in, you know, shields and engines if you're trying to run away, or you might have all the weapon, uh, energy in weapons if you're actively engaging. So those all just go over, they might have. So it, yeah, that's how it sounds like it's going to be, like the Elite Dangerous system. Or uh, having said the Elite Dangerous system, I'm sure it's that kind of... Um, resource management, however you want to put it, is a uh, style of uh, doing things has appeared in other games as well, where you have a, a finite amount of resource and then you've got to split it between different areas of focus. Just sink already! Oh. Let's go down to battle sails so I can get the guns down enough. For some reason when I... Yeah, that's that's kind of annoying. It, it points me at the sails. I don't want to be pointing at the sails. I want to be looking at the. Uh... Right, he's got no armor left on either side. Just, just sink. Just, just sink. Just come on, stop prolonging the inevitable. There we go, striking his sails. With one, right. So I can go leave battle, not exit game. That would be the wrong thing. Careful with the US faction, you might be trapped in an embassy for years. Okay. So there we go, we've com completed an order, even. Uh, took a bit of damage, but that's fine. You can you can use one repair when you're in a battle. Unless there's some upgrade later on that lets you get more. And um, yeah, so it, that's actually, it. for the battle I got 2.3k and 48 XP. And then for completing the orders, I got another 50 and 2500. So it's not just the order 
bonus, uh, the, the order completion rewards, you actually get the battle reward as well. So it's nice, it stacks. So we can use a couple of repairs just to get things back. And it, it seems a little silly to me that you can magically um, repair the crew, like you can magically get crew back when you're at sea. It, 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 it's a little bit, I don't know. <laughs> You'd think you'd have to go back into port to pick up more crew, but no, it, it just magically gives you more crew. So, um, Beaufort, I could, I mean, there's Charleston. Charleston's not that far away. I could click my teleport to capital button and we could go get that yacht. I think I've also got a ship that I sent to Charleston. So, uh, that I could sell, because we actually, um, myself and, I think it was with Hildebrand, we actually captured a trader, and I don't really want to... I mean, I could take it out for a spin, but I think I'd just rather sell it, to be honest. Um, traders, and uh, just captured ships generally, they have less durability. So they the, the ship itself has less lives, if you like. It can only be sunk so many times. Um, have I looked at Black Wake? I know of Black Wake, but I haven't really done in uh, done any kind of in-depth anything of it. So, yeah. That was one of the things in Sid Meier's Pirates, actually, uh, Schrott's, uh, Schrott's Shadle. You, you could recruit, when you captured ships, you could potentially cr recruit crew. You could bring a certain percentage on board. This, by the way, is the cooldown. We're waiting for the teleport to happen. I just, I, you know what? We'll just, we'll get the yacht. And if you were one of the sea trials people, uh, you know, that bought it then, or if you, um, I think some of the early access Steam people got it as well. I'm not actually sure who got the yacht and who didn't. But yeah, I've got a couple of ships available that are kind of single-use redeemables. Apart from the yacht, which I can redeem once a day. So even if I lose the yacht, I've always got a yacht, essentially. So it's kind of like the cutter. It's like a bonus cutter, if you were one of the uh, earlier backers. And I can't even really say that I was, to be honest, because uh, the reason I got in... I actually emailed the uh, Game Labs and said, you know, I'm interested in your game. Could you uh, provide me with a Steam key? Would that be okay? And they went, yeah, we have enough people for now. And I was like, but but I has a YouTube's and they just didn't care. So it was actually Ram JB having a spare Steam key that let me, um, yeah. <laughs> so. Anyway, so we have a yacht. We'll probably take the yacht. Um, in theory, right equipment. We'll take off the four. Wait, why does that say four pounders? Did I buy the upgraded guns? I'm not sure. Let's stick them in the warehouse. And I swear I captured a ship. Was it on a different server? Does that make a difference? I don't know. In theory, PvP 1 and PvP 3 are kind of clones of each other. But... Uh... Maybe that's all over on PvP 3, basically. Anyway, um... Base medium cannon? Why can't I stick that on... It didn't know. We might have to see what cannons are available. Um... Six pounders, we should. Now, this is one of the things at the moment. Um, I don't know how do I. Um, the, the interface is a bit of a muddle at the moment. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, it, it's one of those, it's like, they've. I think they're bringing in some improvements with the next big update, but uh, it relies on you just knowing stuff. It doesn't tell you a lot, so I can't actually say offhand 
what sort of guns I can mount. I would th think... It would be the same as the cutter, in which case I'm sure I can get six pounders. But these are... Can class 10. These are the basic ones. I'm, I swear I upgraded. But again, it might have been on another server. I, I'm, it might actually have been on the PvP, uh, PvE server that I upgraded. I just one of these, like, playing on different servers <clears throat> and, and remembering what you did on what server. That's probably going to be the tricky part. £68 cannon. Yeah, we should get some of those uh, first-class cannons. Oh, you only get up to £42-pounders. Oh, you can get 68 pounder carronades, though. Good lord. Okay. Right. Um. Place contract. See, I have no idea what that does. There's so much stuff that I don't know yet, and it's mostly to do with the open world stuff. I'm, I'm fairly competent when it comes to the... Like, it's come back to me somewhat, all the battle stuff. That hasn't changed that much, but, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> what guns? <laughs> what guns? What guns do I have? I guess six pounders? Surely I can fit six pounders. So I could have medium or long. Uh, mediums are faster firing, but have less range, and obviously the longs have... The inverse of that. And then you've got the carronades, which are basically shotguns, more or less. Especially if you put grape shot in them. But you have to be pretty close to use carronades. Huh. What do I want to have a go with? I guess we'll try the long six pounders for now. Uh, buy. Confirm. Okay, so I should be able to go to... There we go, so we can have long six pounders. For some reason, those... Uh... Yeah, so it's the base. So we might as well just sell them, because they're taking up... Like, they, they're free to buy. Yeah, the base medium four pounders. So we've got the yacht with uh, long six pounders. And again, this has free repair kits, so that's fine. Uh, the basic cutter. Can I sell it, or will it just sit here forevermore? I mean, these are the ships available at the moment. I could potentially just buy a, a, a better ship. I actually have enough for a, a Lynx. Well, with a little more gold, I have enough for links. But we're going to just sail around in the yacht for the time being, because it's, you know, it's bling. It's it's very bling. Uh, no, there's no ammo, Brett. Um, you don't even have to buy provisions for the crew, either. Oh, place contract. Sets up a contract that other players can see and take if they wish to deliver said goods. Ah, so that's um, player contracts, essentially. The way of uh, getting players to do things. I used to know what the hotkeys were for removing the HUD elements, uh, but I can't remember it now. It's not the function keys, I don't think. No, but you could remove. Like I, I obviously looked it up for the purpose of, of screenshotting things, but yeah, you can. There is a way of getting the HUD to disappear. But it's a Control X, Control Alt. No, I'm just trying to find key combinations. Anyway, never mind. This is the yacht. It's painted very nicely. Uh, as you can see, I've got my six pounders there. This actually, when you first redeem it, you get no guns with it. So you have to grind enough cash to actually uh, get guns. So, shall we take another mission? Put the yacht through its places? Or else I could just sail south. We might just sail south, actually. Let's just... Um uh, have I played on the test server? Which test server? Warships or will of tanks? For will of tanks. No, I have not. I haven't installed that. The yacht, by the way, uh, this is one of the best ships for turning through the wind. 
Like it has exceptional downwind uh, maneuvering capability, and it, it's it's really in capability no different from a cutter. I think you get the same amount of crew. So it's a very it's it's a nice little ship, and it's a bit bling because uh, nobody else really has one. The conquest for Santa Cruz started now. Where is Santa Cruz and who's attacking it? If it's popping up, it might be us that's, uh, you know, the US that's attacking it. Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz. There's no finder thing at the moment. You can't just type in, you know, the name of a, a, a port and, uh, nope. No, don't know where Santa Cruz is. Just have to look it up on a real world map and try and get some idea. I did know that there was some, like, there was supposed to be, a, it was supposed to go up a couple of days ago, and then, I don't know, it all went pear-shaped, apparently. Oh, anyone at Charleston want to do missions? Actually, okay. We could maybe form an impromptu group with somebody, and uh, we could actually see what it's like sailing in company, which I've uh, which I've done before. We're actually turning around and going back to Charleston. But well, it's a nice looking little ship, this. Yes, being invited to the group, which means I will be able to... Uh, if they're actually in Charleston, we wouldn't see them until they like left the port. But this might be somebody that's starting out. I don't know. We get a bit more XP, a bit more cash, and uh, the ability to have bigger ships. I mean, you really do have to Your spend the time climbing the lower tier ships. Thanks to the follow, Volker, Volker friend, maybe. I I, I don't quite know. Um, is this new? Midshipman. Oh, that's, that's an actual player, but that's not. I don't know where this guy that's invited me to a group is. Uh, wow, I completely misspelled Charleston there. Anyway, um... Yeah. Oh, the War of 1812. That, the, the war where everybody claims they won. That one. It was won by Britain, but also the United States, but also by Canada. It's a pretty good war, really. No losers, only winners. Apart from some of the native um, groups in in the US, who really, really, really did lose out. If anyone's the losers, it's them. They got royally boned by the United States. You know, in a variety of ways. It wasn't just that one time, obviously, but that was a particular time when they got royally boned by the United States. Switch to group chat. Oh, well, okay. But yeah, that was that was one occasion, but there were many others. It's like let, let's just let's just you know we already. I don't know. It started off a, a long fine tradition, or was in the middle of a long fine tradition of screwing over the people that was already there. But are they already in a battle? It's funny because in Britain, the War of 1812, I mean, I think it's more of a thing in America, but of course, uh, in Britain, it really was, um, it's one of these things where it's all about perspective, like what else was going on at the time. It was, it was really an adjunct to the Napoleonic Wars. 
it was really a, a much more minor thing compared to Napoleon, who was literally right next door, so we were much less concerned about what was going on over... Oh, there we go. Who is that? Akbar. Uh, yeah, so it, it was... It, it's one of these things where, of course, for the US, it was... Um, uh, a war that was next door to them, so therefore it has more prominence uh, of place in their sort of local history, as it were. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of geography and geopolitics and different perspectives of history going on. Then again, Napoleon had also Russia to keep him. Yes. It is interesting, though. I mean, it was... It was within living memory of, of course, the... Um, uh, the American Revolution so I mean I can see why it's a bigger thing in US history because it was the first test if you like of the United States and it was against their old enemies the, the, the British who some were convinced were still intending to reinvade and try and take back the US and uh, as far as memory serves that really wasn't their intent at that time Oh, hello, you've got a... What is that? It's a third-rate frigate of some kind. Is that a... Like a... Oh, I, I can't even remember all the ship names. I want to say like a Trincomalee or something. Right, this is... Uh, we're travelling annoyingly upwind right now. So I'm having to do lots of tacking. Well, there's a lot of time between then and now, Chaser. I mean, there was a lot of um, almost enmity between, or well, not exactly enmity, but um, like the whole war on terror thing and then um, France and America weren't exactly the best of friends, but then for a long time, I mean, France and America actually have some quite deep historical ties. Well, I say deep, you know, as deep as American historical ties can be, but uh, it, it, it kind of, I don't know, it kind of went out the window a bit. And then other times there's stuff that goes back way, way further that still kind of has an effect today. And you look at the, the, the history between and it's probably not that widely known about these days, but, but England and Portugal. And actually one of the oldest historic treaties in effect in the world that's still active and from something around the 12th, 13th century was a treaty between England and Portugal that is still technically in effect today. And it was um, one of the reasons why Portugal stayed neutral in World War II because there were serious concerns from the, uh, the Allies, from the British that because at the time they were a, a right-wing dictatorship, they would um, they would join the Axis, and Britain went, hey, remember that treaty we signed 800 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> so that that's, you know, that that's one of these things where you get this, this very old bit of geopolitics that was still relevant in a very major way. And even in Scotland, they still talk about the old alliance, the friendship between uh, Scotland and France. Because, of course, Scotland for many years was, uh, you know, they, they needed powerful allies to counterbalance um, the English. And France was one of them. So, yeah. So he's got a very big ship. What is that? I think that's just one of the more generic frigate types. A third-rate two-decker. We've also got uh, a pirate ship, one of them ones, 
a pirate cutter, whatever the heck they're called, and just a basic cutter. So let's oh, go on. Front ammo! Why did I change front ammo? I don't have no front ammo. Let's change to gunnery focus. French relations have been swinging all over the place since the very beginning. Yeah, there's, there's, things are never simple between nations. Never ever. Anyway, the guy in the big ship's just like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna mash their sails, and you guys can, uh, you guys can do the rest. Because this is otherwise a hilariously mis mismatched fight between uh, a little uh, pirate brig and uh, not brig, cutter, whatever. Privateer. There we go. There's the word I'm looking for. So I'm just gonna quickly whiz through the wind. And it holds its speed a hell of a lot better. Like I said, this thing going through the wind is um, it's a real nippy little bugger. Yeah, the, the, oh, well, Irish neutrality, that's a whole other, yeah, bit of history. That's a whole other bit of history. What I find interesting is that although American foreign policy was sort of very isolationist for quite a long time, you then it, it was then the Americans essentially that that ended the isolate, isolationist policy and, and uh, of, of Japan and ended up uh, being the catalyst for Japan. Uh, becoming a, a, a westernized nation. There's kind of some weird irony in there somewhere. And of course there was uh, various things in China as well. There was more the, the, the sort of European western nations that were active in China, but the US... The US was uh, not entirely, it's not like they weren't also in China. In the latter part of the uh, the 19th century. It's just, it's interesting that it was the US, you'd think it'd be, uh, it, it, you look at the history of Japan and the, the, the people that were trying to get access to, to this, this really quite rapidly isolationist Japanese state were sort of the Portuguese and the Dutch in particular and the Brits also occasionally had a go but um, yeah it was the US basically turning up with a bunch of warships going right just just trade with us now or, or we'll, we'll you know come and send more gunboats <laughs> It was very 19th century, send a gunboat, but uh, it was kind of, I don't know, it was a wake-up call to Japan and uh, it didn't go well, as it turned out. And this poor little privateer's got, got no chance. How on earth did we end up, oh, he just lost all his sails. How on earth did we end up all this uh, history chat anyway? I suppose it's sort of inevitable when you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, he just completely got demasted. It's rather nice that this Akbar guy though is helping. Uh... I've actually I've noticed that there's a lot more um, like people helping people level up kind of thing. Right, am I? Is he now blocking my shot? Yes. Let's not fire at the uh, way I like. Oh, you're a U.S. history teacher. Okay. So you've got an excuse for knowing stuff. I just, I don't even, my knowledge isn't even that coherent. It's just random bits and pieces that I've picked up over the years. I gotta be honest. And I've probably forgotten half the stuff I ever learned at school. Especially as regards Scottish history. I vaguely remember some stuff about Alexander II and then, and, and the Maid of Norway and then it all goes very fuzzy after that. 
Right, it looks like that guy's boarding. He's trying to board. So actually what I'll do is I'll kill speed and switch to grape. Because killing crew helps. Warships equals anime chat, GTA equals random chat, Kerbal equals science chat. Yeah, I could be playing Kerbal Space Program and we'd all be talking about LIGO and uh, gravitational waves, probably. Uh, but yeah, uh, and then this is just history chat, I guess. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> anyway. Now, him as the, uh, this guy's the boarding ship, who is this? Megalzios. Um, he's going to get the lion's share of the loot, basically. In fact, I think it's only if you're boarding, you're the only one who gets to have the loot, essentially. So I'm just aiding him. Your business is appreciated. Thanks for the follow, Bluthazar. I should probably tell these guys I'm streaming, actually. Yeah, he's got a, a clear crew advantage. He should easily take this guy. Oh, American Truck Simulator. I should have known you'd have jumped on that, Ginge. Oh, the, the guy with the big ship says, hello, chat. You probably can't read that very well. But yeah, I've played a little bit of Euro Truck Simulator 2. Um basically just I, I, I could just get a big loan buy a truck but I've just been doing the the single driving mission things and just getting a little bit of cash would you believe I haven't crashed once Ginge I have one speeding fine until I figured out that you really have to pay attention I think the very first mission I did I got a speeding fine because I, I hadn't realized quite how much you have to pay attention to the speed limit and um, you know speed cameras but um, yeah no it, it it's uh, <laughs> it's been the case that I like the first five missions I got the steam achievement for doing five missions in a row from start to finish without any accidents so believe it or not I, I can drive slightly better when it's not trying to be uh, not trying to win a rally Anyway, uh, leave battle, there we go, yes. So, no, anything, I got 600 gold and 2 XP. Because <laughs> it was one small enemy ship and shared out experience wise amongst four of us it, it really wasn't a big uh, a big reward but anyway uh, I'm just gonna be a second where I get uh, where's the epic loots you only get epic loots from boarding actions if you are the person that's boarding basically so I wasn't anyway I'll be right back I'm just getting some water
Right, the wind has actually died down a bit as well, in terms of, you know, real life. <laughs> the actual wind where I am. Still a little bit on the noisy side, so I probably won't play too much longer. So I'm just going to stick with the big guy. Yeah, I know. That's my door. That's my kitchen door. It wasn't me collapsing. I read Ginge, didn't they make that, um, didn't they make that a bit nicer for newer players? Like they reduced the fines for the, like the lower levels instead of making it quite so harsh. It's also interesting that they've done it with there's actual police cars that you have to worry about because of course in ETS 2 uh, it's only speed cameras even if you just get into the most horrendous smash up and obviously you're going to have a repair bill but it's not like there's uh, um, anything beyond that you don't have to <laughs> you don't get reported to the procurator fiscal or anything I'm just going to follow this guy for now did, he just, did I just say my kitchen door collapses? Yes, that's exactly what I said. 100%. I have an incredible collapsing kitchen door. I should probably say, actually. Anyway, um... Oh, I see. That makes sense then. If there's if speed cameras aren't such a thing in the U.S., if it's it's more reliant on cops with uh, radar guns. That tends to be less of a thing in the U.K. You'll get the police will go and randomly set up, like they'll go and sit in a location with their their speed guns. But a lot of it, um, I, I, there's probably a lot of statistical analysis involved. Like they probably look at where accidents happen the most and go, right, we're going to put some speed cameras there, and we're going to put some traffic bumps there, that kind of thing. I suspect that's how they do it. But of course there are various sort of groups that are um, rather against speed cameras, just on the principle of, I don't know. But I always, I always wince when Jeremy Clarkson starts talking about speed cameras. Because he can be entertaining, don't get me wrong, but speed cameras, it's its like he wants people to go speeding and have accidents, and I don't know. Santa Cruz, which is captured by pirates, we had that, mas uh, that mis uh, message even earlier, so where the hell is Santa Cruz then? That does place it a little bit. Well, they actually have the north coast of Haiti as well, the pirates. St. Nicholas, no... Just having a look. Is it the north coast of Cuba, maybe? So yeah, the pirates on the US are, are kind of sort of neighbours right now. That's interesting. So that might be the major conflict uh, conflict is between the US and the pirates. Yeah, the, the the Britain doesn't really have um, the equivalent of uh, highway patrol at all. Uh, there's no like the 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 way it works in the UK is it, it it it's devolved to the various local police forces. Where of course in the US the law enforcement system there's a lot more kind of like you've got the highway patrol but then you've got obviously local police departments and then you've got the sheriff's departments and then it's all it's very convoluted why did you have to make it so complicated we've got we, we've got the regional police forces and then we've got some sort of special exceptions like the british transport police who are mainly concerned with the railways though i, I don't know they might I wonder if the British Transport Police has any presence in the ports as well. 
But even stuff like uh, River Police, um, that tends to be like specialist units of um, like the, the Thames River Police are basically a unit of the, the Metropolitan Police from what I understand. So it's not like that's a separate thing. We have traffic wombles, that's exactly right. Oh, and the, um, the, uh, the, yeah, wasn't there a, a thing a couple of years ago with Dutch, air quotes, activists going around vandalizing speed cameras? Which, honestly, just, that that's just, you know, criminal damage to government property. That never seems like a good idea to me, but okay, sure. I suspect when when people when they are like against speed cameras it's because they see it as a way of, of government making profit out of people. Except the way the government makes profit out of people is if those people are breaking the law. So it always seems slightly odd to me, like why why don't you just not break the law? I don't know. Maybe I'm just a simpleton in that regard. Right, we're just waiting for... Do I need to... I don't think I even need to use... Uh... No, I don't need to use a repair kit. I think I actually get... Is it the same number of repair kits, or is it slightly more? I swear it's 21 with the cutter. Or maybe I'm just misremembering. It might be 24 with the cutter as well. The USCG. Uh, Coast Guard? Aren't the Coast Guard a military force? I'm pretty sure the Coast Guard's actually a branch of the military, aren't they? They're, they're organised as a uh, a military branch. There's really nothing like that in the UK. Um, even the... Um, well, actually, no, the closest thing might be the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. Which are a kind of adjunct to the Royal Navy. Um, it, it's sort of I mean it's obviously a military connected service but it is um, manned by like the the RFA ships are manned by civilian sailors essentially so it's a, a separate I don't know if it counts as a military service or not the RFA the closest you have to a, a gendarme yeah okay I suppose that's one way of looking at it yeah a, a military law enforcement agency because uh, I suppose the the Coast Guard, yeah, they kind of they kind of do. I suppose their focus is more on law enforcement. We don't really have that in the UK. Um, we've got um, more of a focus on. We really only have search and rescue of various kinds, because there's the the RNLI, the Lifeboat Service, which is a, a charity. And it's actually it, it's technically an international charity because the RNLI provides lifeboat services for both uh, Britain and Ireland. Uh, although there are other more localized lifeboat services, but in terms of air sea rescue, that's all done by um, the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, which is a, a you know civilian government agency. So it's it, it's a mixture of charity and uh, government agency that that provides coastal rescue. Oh, someone's asking me how I got the yacht. Um, I and then I oh, friend invite from yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Have they updated the UI yet? No, Ginge, basically. Um, there might be some in the next big patch that's coming, but... Right, towards Beaufort, apparently. We'll do one more, um... 
I'll actually just let these guys know. So I think we're now... Didn't we have a fourth person? I don't know. I guess somebody dropped out. You do have to, like, mostly... There's occasionally stuff that comes up with the police. Um, some police forces have worse reputations than others. And it's always, always a big deal when you get... Um, uh, kind of unlawful deaths. And uh, it, it's... Yeah... It tends to be, I mean, at least it's horrible when it happens, but I think the system is a bit more robust in the UK because you have the, the, the PCC, the Police, uh, Police Complaints Commission, um, who, it's like a separate body that, that looks into any kind of serious police incident. And uh, in, the, in the US, of course, um, uh, police forces tend to investigate themselves. Although I think a lot of um, like the big pol police forces will tend to have kind of uh, internal investigation divisions, internal affairs divisions, but um, in, in, in Britain it's just a whole entire separate thing basically. But uh, yeah, one of the things I was particularly aware of when I was uh, more into photography as a hobby was uh, there were lots of instances of, of police forces um, uh, telling people, oh, you can't photograph here, you can't do this, you can't do that, you know, in blatant actual violation of, of people's actual rights. So there was a lot of advice going around, well, this is what you say, and this is what you do, and you just be very polite about it. But there were still, unfortunately, instances, uh, I think particularly a couple with the Metropolitan Police in London, of, um, the, you know, just a couple of police officers being utter assholes. And just making the entire Met look like assholes by, you know, association. And doing things like um, taking people's cameras away from them. And, and I think there was, there was one young guy that got basically pushed down a flight of stairs by a particularly aggressive police officer. And, and the whole thing was filmed and he was just being very polite and stating his rights. And this officer just literally pushed him down a flight of stairs. Not a big flight of stairs, I'm not, you know, he didn't push him down several stories or anything like that, but still. Right, which of these instances is it going to be? Not actually sure. Uh, it depends who's got the... I think this guy's got the mission, so it's whoever leads the mission pulls the rest of us into the instance, basically. Yeah, a lot of it, that's the thing with, with anything like dealing with police forces or anything like that. It's all down to, um, I think that's all, an uh, uh, instance that's already ongoing, so we don't want to join that. We're just following this guy, I think. It literally comes down to the, the individual officers you're dealing with. and I don't know, if they're having a bad day, they might take it out on somebody else. Because they, they have that power, unfortunately. Right, here we go. Here's the instance. Yeah, my understanding is that, that during peacetime, uh, the Coast Guard, the US Coast Guard, um, they basically, like, they're, obviously their primary focus is um, dealing with, well, anything that comes within their remit. So search and rescue, but also any law enforcement. Um, I think they regularly are involved with things like drug busts and, you know, stopping smuggling by sea and that kind of thing. And they're also involved with people trying to um, immigrate, I think particularly from Cuba, and there's all that kind of thing going on. But in times of war, they can be essentially co-opted as a um, sort of second-line military force and their, their law enforcement duties sort of uh, become uh, much less important 
the focus becomes on uh, kind of coastal defence, as it were. Because Coast Guard ships are armed. Or at least some of them. The Coast Guard cutters. I think I was actually reading up about that one time, the history of the Coast Guard during uh, World War II. But it's been a long time. Right, I think we're going to focus this guy first. This is a pair of... Like... What are these? So let's set gun in focus. It's a pair of privateers, I think. Let's not ram into them. But yeah, it was interesting. It's interesting reading. Where's the other one? We don't want the other one to float away, but obviously concentrating fire. It's probably the way to go here. <coughs> Oh, let's go to oh, battle sails. There we go, that's the one I want. It's still a bit gusty. But, um, in terms of, you know, the actual weather right now, but I think I might. I might, um, have a go at recording anyway. Because it's, uh, getting towards mid afternoon. I haven't actually had lunch yet. Oh, let's not bump into this guy. Back to battle sails. Now, because we're using the long six pounders, they do have uh, a longer reload. And for this kind of close up work, actually, the carronades would have been very, very nice. Carronades uh, pack a, a serious punch. I will never tire of pointing out carronades are Scottish. I I was quite amused to see that there was actually um, a Scottish company founded by again a, a, a guy called I think it was James Caron, but I can't remember exactly. It was something Caron, hence the name Carronade. So uh, yeah, carronades, hundred percent Scottish. We're absolutely hammering this guy, he's going down. Which means we won't get any loot out of him, but on the other hand, more XP, I think. I think you get more XP for, for killing ships and capturing them. So we can now turn our attention on the other guy. You opened a random stream room, we were talking about the US Coast Guard. It's just... Just be thankful it wasn't anime, is all I can say, uh, Sfraps. Just be thankful we weren't all talking about anime. I think they still haven't... Uh, this was an, an old complaint of Jingles uh, where he said, yeah, the battle flags are just random. Or the, the ensigns. Not the ensigns. No, it would be, yeah, the, the, the top mast flags or the main mast flags or whatever the hell you want to call it. The flags. The pennants. Or flags and pennants. Um, I don't think that's changed. I think they are just still random. And it would be nice if they actually reflected what you were doing in battle. That would be kind of cool. You don't know how realistic this game is, but you never find comes going down on the way. Uh, it well, it's they have made some sacrifices. They have made some sacrifices to um, you know game mechanics, Your which is, is kind of inevitable. You kind of have to. But yeah, no, you can you can do stuff like that. You can uh, you can sail around in the middle of a storm with full sail, with no ill effects, which is just silly. But you can do it. <laughs> but yeah, in terms of the actual the the tactics, though, I mean, it does, uh, especially when it was the the bigger line battles of the early sea trials and you'd have like 40 ships fighting against each other or more. I think the biggest 
ones were in the range of 60 to 70 ships. And it was, um, you know, just recreating some of the, <laughs> the biggest uh, sailing uh, ship naval battles that there ever were. And uh, you'd get at least a couple of people with knowledge of the actual naval tactics of the era. That would go like, right, for the line, for the line, we're going to cross here, we're going we're gonna to cross the T, and then we're going to all fire our guns at the lead ship, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. So I think there's a fair few actual history buffs that, that, that have played and do play this game. That know enough about the tactics to know the kind of... The, the, the kind of uh, uh, the, the, the actual in-game uh, in, in, in battle strategies that were actually used a couple in the water but that's fine yeah no actually the wind's picked up again I really don't want to go out to the shops. I mean, I really don't want to, but I'm going to have to, I think. I'm going to have to put on my waterproof legs. Because, you know, you want your legs to be waterproof. It's a bit of a problem if you've got legs and the water gets in. Um, yeah. And uh, stick on my coat and put my hood up and jam on a hat and just lean into the wind as far as I can go. The thing is, when it's like this, you can't even get that much uh, shopping back because... Uh, I'm in walking distance, but it's um, it's a bit of a walk. It's a good thing I'm in walking distance, because if I was having to wait on buses, uh, that would be very limiting. But yeah, on days like this, the walk becomes very unappealing for some reason. actually bounced. I did I did like when they introduced that because you could finally be sailing around in your USS Constitution and actually have cannonballs bounce off the side which had to be very pleasing for the Constitution uh, captains. They could finally live up to its nickname of Old Ironsides. Whoa 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 which way are you turning Mr. AI ship? Let's not turn that way then. I'm trying to turn in, out turn in but no. Right we're gonna get Full broadside point blank, but we're pretty healthy. A full broadside from a privateer isn't that much. These are. Um, I keep wanting to say rank. These lower rank battles, these lower rating battles, these smaller ship battles. Uh, looks like the big ship and the frigates firing chain. They tend to be more kind of wars of attrition or battles of attrition. You just whittle away at the, the health of the enemy ships. Over and over. Yeah, even sailing this close to the wind, though, I'm still keeping a fair amount of speed. Get right on the wind with much less penalty in the yacht. That's one of the nice things about it. Nope, <laughs> it was all wet in the water. <laughs> Reap. Oh well. That, that somehow doesn't surprise me, Sombra. I suppose you'd have that much in common. Can't you just... <laughs> can't you just, like, get a big screen, place a uh, surgeon simulator and go, right, this is what I do all day. Because that'd be totally... The surgeon simulator is totally realistic, right? <laughs> the parents. Actually, um, my uh, uncle, my step-uncle, my stepmom and brother, who also lives on the island, 
Uh, he taught in, uh, he was a teacher in England for 30 years. That is a bit weird. Like the texture sometimes, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think that's... My, my gun is suddenly made of splinters. Splintered wood. Uh, yeah, he was a teacher for 30 odd years in various places, including in London. And I am getting myself shredded by my allies here. Uh, yeah, sometimes it, it was... It was the, the reason he finally retired. Um, I think he actually retired a little early compared to when he could have. Um, but it was... Sometimes the teachers, but also just the increasing, um... Oh, I turned dead on the wind there and managed to bring myself to a complete halt. Uh, the kind of increasing uh, amounts of paperwork that he had to do, all that kind of thing. And all the targets they had to meet, and all the kind of government goals they had to try and get. And just... Like it just wore him down to the point where it was like, yep, no, okay. I'm 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 done teaching. I've been doing this for three decades. This is this is enough now. But it was funny because before he came here, like he, he had had his driving license since he was a fairly young man, but uh, he basically uh, bicycled to work wherever he lived for thirty years. So when he came up to the islands, he had to relearn how to drive all over again <laughs> which was quite I don't know amusing in some way it's just even though he'd been able to he just he just never had he just always biked which especially when he was teaching in London must have been an interesting experience biking through the streets of London on a daily basis ah, and there goes a mast whoosh that's gonna make him much slower this guy's uh, this guy's actually sinking at this point whoa Right, we're actually getting chain shotted by our. Uh, not chain shot. Yeah, no, it's chain shot. By the frigate. This is, this is just. This is just sticking the boot in at this point. We've killed this guy. Whoa, which way are you? Whoa, which way are you turning, sir? Which way are you turning? You're about to lose your bow spit. <laughs> yeah, he has literally just lost his bow spit. Whoops. Anyway, that one's sinking though, that's fine. I've sprung a leak! Oh dear. It's actually quite um Yeah, we've got we've got a nuclear policeman and a nuclear doctor in here. This is a very radioactive chat. Also, hello, there's forty people watching right now. I was not expecting that for naval action. We Your really have sprung the lead here. Like, thanks for the follows, wraps. Uh, I will say, I will say, normally I play other games. I think this might actually be the first time I've streamed Naval Action. But it won't be the last, I don't think. Um, but yeah, otherwise it's stuff like World of Warships. Um, sometimes stuff like Kerbal Space Program. I haven't actually played that for a while. GTA 5, when I can get it to run smoothly, which uh, apparently it isn't at the moment, which is annoying. Uh, I've also done Mountain Blade Napoleonic Wars before. Uh, what else? I don't know, there's probably a couple of other games I'm forgetting. Um, I've played Fractured Space at least once on the stream. I might come back to that. Oh, yeah, also the battle's over. Oh, you didn't get that, but... Oh, okay. You never did. Oh, that's a pity. But in my head, Brett, in my, bre in my head, you're still... You're still a glowing green radioactive policeman just so you know that's that's apparently you know that's my vision of you is is that's that's you just you're just gonna have to live with it you're just gonna have to live with it um anyway yeah everyone's still invisible right now actually i probably have time for one more because having said uh i i could I could uh, I, I could try and recall. The wind's now picked up again a bit. It's not nearly as bad as it was before, but it's still going to be a bit noisy. Let's add this Akbar guy to the friends list, because why not? Uh, add Fred.
Next Tuesday, you have a job for an insurance claims handler. That's a much less interesting job, I'm not going to lie, Brett. Is it a nuclear insurance claims handler? Because if not, I am going to be severely disappointed. Right, where the hell are we, by the way? I think north is... Charleston? I think we're in this area of water here, but I'm not exactly sure. <clears throat> right, this guy's going south. We'll just follow him. Actually, uh, one of my, my brother's um, former boyfriends um, was into... I'm trying to think what era. I think it was mostly kind of World War Two reenactment stuff. He had a whole bunch of um, RAF bits of gear. But I think he might have had some... I, I, he might have had an interest in kind of 19th century stuff as well. But yeah, reenactment is not a cheap hobby at all. Not at all. But I just remember being once down in Brighton and being dragged, well I say dragged, going around various shops and it was like, you know, you, you can buy a, a decommissioned Maxim machine gun for £2,000 and, and various rifles and muskets and uniforms and all kinds of bits. Right, we're sailing to Beaufort. We're going to sail to Beaufort and pick up uh, a thing. But yeah, uh, what was the guy's name? Adam, I think. That, yeah, Adam. But yeah, his main area of interest was uh, World War Two RAF stuff for some reason. Which, I, I, I don't know. If you were... I mean, if it was something like Tank Fest and you get all the reenactors, then you could have a... Um, that was... I mean, if I go back to Tank Fest this year, I am absolutely going to have more of a wander around the reenactment area. Because I totally neglected that last year. Absolutely. Civil War's probably the biggest reenactment. I'm not surprised. Um, where am I going? That's like a little bay. Let's not go into the little bay. We're going this way. No, the main problem is... I'm just hugging the coastline right now. Uh, this is probably this bay here. So we're about halfway to Beaufort. Uh, no, not Beaufort. More than halfway. This area. There we go. So Beaufort's just around this headland. Um, <laughs> nuclear insurance claims. <laughs> Actually, I was reading a thing about um, nuclear power in the news as well. EDF, who's one of the biggest nuclear operators in the UK. Um, I think they operate... Actually, I don't know how many plants they operate. Something like eight nuclear plants. But um, they're extending the lifetime of some of their existing plants. Because... Um, building new nuclear plants is horribly expensive. And there's one project in the works right now, but um, they... Uh, it was something like the, the total cost of the project exceeds the market capitalization of EDF energy as a whole. Which is like, mm, yeah, you can see why this, this project is maybe stalled a bit. Even though it's a third backed by a, uh, a Chinese energy company but it's one of the things where the, we have this issue in the UK of, of uh, especially with nuclear power plants um, the early generations of nuclear power plants were all funded by the government and then of course come the 1980s we have privatization as a thing and suddenly these are all being held by private companies and okay well sure but because of the massive cost involved in setting up new plants, uh, it's because government is not investing in this anymore. Um, we're having a problem now of the the in the UK at least. Um, we're getting an increasing kind of gap or or a decreasing gap between our uh, maximum energy sort of generation capacity and the the amount we need at the peak times of the year, i.e. the winter. So, yeah, it's a bit of a problem. And meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, the British government's also cutting down on renewable energy subsidies. 
which uh, certain forms of renewable energy would actually give you more during the winter, especially wind and wave power, which uh, has, has really had a very bad effect on the UK renewables, uh, uh, especially the small-scale renewables industry in the UK generally. And uh, I don't know, we've, we've got what looks like horribly a, a looming energy crisis unless somebody somewhere does something. But hey, in Germany they're building uh, cool fusion reactors and China's doing cool things with fusion reactors as well, so... Who knows, maybe fusion is not that far off now. Because, uh, although Tauruses have been around for a long time, I'm completely jumping subjects here. Uh, they've, they've already had some very promising results from the, uh, the, the Stellarator that have got the, the Waldenstein X7 in uh, Germany. Which is, um, it's some cool stuff, man. Stellarators are just freaking awesome. I mean, Tokamaks are pretty cool, but Stellarators are just, like, Stellarators are just so freaking awesome, I can't even tell you. But they've already had some really promising results, even though the thing hasn't been switched on that long. So who knows? Maybe Tokamaks aren't the future at all, because Tokamak research has never really... Like, they're still struggling to get more energy out than they put in, whereas uh, uh, Stellarator technology... And once you've, you've got the stable configuration of uh, uh, magnetic fields set up to contain the plasma, it's like, well, it doesn't have half the problems that that, that, um, that uh, uh, Tokamaks have, except Stellarators are hugely expensive and difficult to actually construct and set up, so there is that. Anyway, um... There you go, now you know a little bit more about fusion than you knew before. Okay, we're going to take a junior lieutenant, or, wow, lieutenant, I'm, I'm role-playing as an American, obviously, normally I'd say lieutenant, but, uh, obviously, you know, anyway, junior lieutenant rewards, uh, uh, mission rather. Okay, so, I've taken the order. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't even, I don't even, let's look at the chat, I was just doing a whole spiel there. Um... Right, uh, where is this? Let's actually have a quick look. I didn't see where it was. Hey, Mawo! Well, um, yeah, there's... there's... Chernobyl seems... Uh, I would have thought Three Mile Island would have been more of a, you know, pertinent thing. But, yeah. Chernobyl had a thing. Actually, I almost think, um... In the last couple of years, uh, the Fukushima is probably a lot more freshly on people's minds. But Japan has that unique problem of lots of coastline, and they're on the Pacific Rim of, you know, fire. So um, lots of uh, tectonic uh, activity, potential for tsunamis, that kind of thing. But Japan really doesn't have a lot of choice. But that has, I mean, Germany vastly scaled back in uh, I think Germany basically sort of said right no more nuclear and uh, as far as I know France is still the most nuclear nation in the world like they have a huge amount of their a huge portion of their energy generation from nuclear which is probably why the you know the Britain's biggest nuclear plant operator is a French company because they've they're the ones with the experience um, right orders where am I looking missions it just says near Beaufort. It doesn't say what direction. Um, right. Never mind. Weird. Uh, okay, weird. That is... Okay, Chernobyl. But anyone that knows anything about the actual reasons for the Chernobyl disaster happening would, would realise that uh, it was just a complete... Like, it was a... A, 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 a not very good design of plant which was um, completely, like, the, the plant operators were just ignoring all of the safety limits. Like, it was utterly a man-made fuck-up. It wasn't anything to do with uh, the inherent anything of, of nuclear power. And you look at Fukushima and actually, um, 
the main problem was contaminated wastewater. It wasn't, there wasn't otherwise a release of nuclear material. And actually the containment vessel, even though it, the, the Fukushima plant was an older Japanese plant, uh, the actual reactor containment vessel held up incredibly well. Considering it got hit by a freaking tsunami, um, so it wasn't even the like the the actual Fukushima. If it had been a badly designed plant, if it had been kind of you know Soviet era, Soviet technology plant, it could have been so much more worse. But I, I guess in the UK we've been lucky because the worst nuclear incident we've had has been wind scale, and. Um, that wasn't even a nuclear power generation. That was a nuclear um, uh, a fissile material for weapons um, reactor, and uh, it's you know the wind scale fire is still pretty horrible to read about, but the scale of it is um, quite small in comparison to other nuclear accidents. Although that site is still kind of closed off and contaminated today. So, anyway, right, I don't see, it just says near Beaufort, I don't actually know where this, uh, oh, not paying attention. Trader's Brig. Two, <laughs> I just, this guy was saying stuff. Where is this, uh, well, that's Savannah. It's somewhere, it says, I don't know, it just said near Beaufort, so I'm having issues finding this. Anyway, yeah, we've gone from the history of, of, of the United States Coast Guard and its status as a military branch to talking about nuclear disasters and, <laughs> I don't even know, nuclear power generation. But that would be so cool, though. I mean, it might, it might easily... <laughs> There's always that, that old sore about, you know, it's, it's always ten years away, nuclear fusion, but... Uh, I can well see it happening within my lifetime. Commercial power generation from nuclear fusion. And it's just, it, it is absolutely like this is, um, this is how we solve the current, or one of the big ways we solve the current need for always on power generation as opposed to a lot of renewables which are, um, you know, they're sometimes on but not always. We don't really have the storage technologies. Oh, press map by... So it's right near Beaufort. Ah. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, we don't have any good way of storing power from renewables at the moment, apart from hydro pump storage schemes. And of course, they're heavily dependent on local geology. And uh, there's a hell of a setup cost with those kind of things. Not just... Um, I mean, like any hydro scheme, it's not just the uh, the actual monetary cost, but the environmental cost potentially as well. But yeah, getting away from fusion and the fact, uh, fission rather, and the fact that you have all this nuclear waste lying around afterwards is quite desirable. Right, that's Beaufort over there, so in theory the, the instance should be over here somewhere. So this is just me rambling, by the way. This is, I don't know. This is a good game for rambling because there's just so much time spent sailing around. It's annoying that we're having to sail upwind, though. That kind of limits it. Welcome to a chat full of reasonable adults that aren't completely bonkers. Really? Is that is that the kind of audience I'm attracting? Oh, dear. Oh, well. I was, I was hoping for a bunch of irrational teenagers as well, but I guess you guys will just have to do. I guess. Seriously, where's this instance? I can't. It should show up faintly on the horizon, but... 
I can't see it. Right, it's closer to Beaufort than Savannah, but it's still sort of to the south of Beaufort, so we should be in the right area. Surely we should be in the right area. Oh, wait, is that it? Wow, that is super faint. There we go. Your business is appreciated. There we go. Can you have a permit? Ask one of the mods very nicely and I'm sure they'll give you one. If I click outside the game window, the, it'll uh, minimise things. You're wondering why you're scrolling in like this? I'm actually scrolling the chat right now, of course. That's uh, scrolling the game as well. But, um, yeah. Anyway, anyway, nuclear power. Fusion. Fusion's what we need. But, you know, there's definitely a place for renewables as well. Which, in Scotland, that was one of the things that particularly irked me. Uh, well, one of the things. When the, the run-up to the, the referendum came along, that nobody was talking about... Um, uh, uh, renewable energy as a as a, a, a sector and um, particularly like there was a lot of talk about fiscal unions and what currency would be used and blah 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 but no one was talking about what economic basis Scotland would be running on because you know our biggest sector financially is banking and we know how reliable that is uh, the Scottish manufacturing sector isn't that big we do have a modest but reasonably successful uh, software um, producing uh, sector, whatever you want to call it. And I think there is actually a uh, an Intel plant in Scotland somewhere that produces uh, chips. And then there's a couple of, of things like chemical plants, and of course you've got... Um, I think it's, um, what's the name of that refinery? I can't remember. Anyway, but yeah, um, and, and, and of course there's there's some presence with the oil sector with North Sea oil and you've got that obviously being a particular factor on the East Coast and uh, around Aberdeen, that kind of area. Um, and there's still a little bit of shipbuilding, but not a lot. So yeah, our main sort of financial sector is banking, which is not what you want to rely on at all, as we know all too well. So... The fact that nobody was then bringing in kind of energy generation and, and whatever to the debate was... Uh, I was extremely disappointed by that. Because that could be a major sector for the... Uh, for, for, you know, potentially for an independent scholar. Not that I was particularly for it, but, you know, I could have been persuaded. I was enough on the fence that, although my inclination was we should stay in the UK, um, there were certain things that... Uh, that... that, that could have changed my mind. One of the other ones was uh, the subject of the monarchy, but we'll we'll not get into that. But yeah, it's 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 a it could be a big thing, especially uh, coastal and wave generation technologies. There was supposed to be a, a, a test wave, uh, not wave, a coastal generation plant being built here on the islands, and then the whole thing. Um, I think the government pulled the funding, or I can't remember what happened exactly, but it all just fizzled out, unfortunately. And Scotland in particular has so much suitable coastline. And the thing with uh, wave and, and, and shoreline uh, coastal power generation, uh, sort of based on hydraulic technologies, um, Britain as a whole has got a lot of coastline, but it, in Scotland in particular, because um, we've got the, the, the North Sea, you know, we've got uh, quite a lot of uh, places where it would be suitable 
and of course it's regular energy unlike onshore and offshore wind and solar and it's not like Scotland's ever going to be a major producer of solar power <laughs> so <laughs> yeah but I was just I don't know there just seems to have been a complete lack of a government investment in in that particular sector and then of course the current Tory government's just been cutting support for renewables as a sector anyway so yeah not a fan of the current Tory government to say the least and it doesn't help when you get complete idiots like Jeremy Hunt ending up in positions of uh, responsibility or people like George Osborne <laughs> Right, where's my ally gone? Also, is this guy shooting my sails or was that my ally that was uh, doing chain shot? Trying to shoot this guy's sails. But it's cool that, that, that Germany at least is investing in uh, kind of the French technology of... Uh, you know, we've got the joint European Taurus in, in Oxfordshire. I know mean, this is get, uh, back to fusion again, but that's, uh, you know, relatively... I'll say relatively small scale. I think it's still one of the biggest Tauruses in Europe, but uh, you yeah, know that's a research uh, sort of uh, thing. I think that's kind of European funded. That's not particularly funded by uh, British uh, establishment. There was actually a thing, was there last year? Yeah, they were talking about drastically cutting funding for. Um, Astro science in particular, which would have had a massive impact on, you know, sites like uh, Jodrell Bank and, and the whatever the, the the array that that's part of in the UK covered. It's called. There's a couple of other satellite uh, satellite what? radio astronomy sites in the UK, and they would they would have been gutted. And it's just I don't know. Government, the current government just does not seem to care about science investment at all. And of course, in terms of stuff like fusion, that then intersects with uh, energy investment. So, yeah. Well, you see, the thing is, Chaser, even though the Tories are... Um, I mean, at the, the moment they're a, a mix... Uh, it like, depends which of the cabinet you're talking about, but they're either sort of, sort of centrist, but... There's uh, a mix there with some real right wingers as well. And the Tories have always been an odd mix of this kind of um, more centrist ground, and I think they've, they've become a, a bit more centrist since um, New Labour and Tony Blair, and they've, they've, they've decided that's the way to go rather than just going for the more kind of right wing conservative vote. But in U.S. terms, I'm sure they'd be called lily livered, you know, communist bleeding heart liberals. Because uh, the nature of US politics is um, somewhat different, shall we say. I'm actually going to turn back through the wind, I think. Try and get him on my other side. So yeah, God knows what uh, what, what US sort of pundits would make of the, the, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats and the Green Party. The Green Party, they'd probably all throw in prison as just being straight up communists. <laughs> anyway. It would be interesting though if people think of British politics as being somehow more respectable and it, it never has been ever 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 at all i was actually listening to a thing the other day um i subscribed to uh, extra credits which i think i've watched one or two of their videos before but um i think circon linked something and actually they've done a, a wargaming sponsored uh a history video because they do kind of stuff around video games and sort of the the process and theory of making video games but they also do stuff about history which is quite interesting although why they do that weird thing where he, he alters the pitch of his voice i don't know what the hell that's about i actually find that kind of annoying to be honest it's livable with but for whatever reason 
yeah, they do that, and it's just kind of okay. Uh, but yeah, they um, did a thing on the South Seas bubble, which I sat and listened to like seven parts of, and I already knew a bit about the South Seas bubble. Uh, there's a rather interesting episode of the BBC Radio 4 show in our time on the South Seas bubble, but it didn't really it like the extra uh, credits. Uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, a series or whatever, but the look at it um, was more focused on different things. And it was actually quite interesting, and then learning uh, about... Because I already knew a little bit about Robert Walpole, but... Uh, yeah, no, he was, a, he was you know, effectively the first Prime Minister of the, the United Kingdom, even though that title didn't actually start to be used until the, the beginning of the 20th century. But he was effectively the first one. And uh, he was just... He was, like... The worst scumbag kind of politician you can imagine, that was Robert Walpole. He just did just everything. It's like insider trading and and all kinds of like playing people off against each other and just straight up lying to people and he was just like Yeah, yeah, he he would not be out of place in modern day politics at all. So anyway. But, um, yeah, it, it's it's always been a bit rough and tumble, shall we say. Right, I'm taking a bit of a beating here, but he's taking an even more beating. Oh, also, I haven't put gunnery focus on, so that's why my guns are taking actually even longer than they uh, were before. But even, even if you do get to a sort of slightly more gentlemanly era of politics, which I don't think there ever really has been, but you get to the 19th century and the great kind of rivalry between uh, Disraeli and uh, Gladstone, for instance, that was a bit more, you know, they they had this, this very long-running political rivalry. But they also rather respected each other. Apart from Gladstone's wife, Gladstone's wife was just absolutely horrible. But um, Gladstone himself and Disraeli, you know, despite this this sort of long, decades-long career of political opposition to each other, they were still um, sort of gentlemen about it, as it were. And I'm not sure you'd get that kind of thing these days. Although Disraeli himself was an interesting cove. He was a very modern politician in a lot of ways. Uh, at a time when the state was a very different thing than it is now. I mean, even you go back to the time of Walpole and the state more or less served uh, at that point. Because um, it was... Uh, you get to the early 18th century and that's when almost... Like, this is post-restoration, post-civil war, all that kind of thing. Like... Parliament is very firmly on the ascendancy. And then you had, especially with the, the reign of Queen Anne, um, it, it, like she was not a particularly active monarch. And so Parliament really started to take the fore in terms of running the country. But uh, in terms of running the country, you know, we say that and we think of the modern state of government. There really wasn't, like, it's not like there was... Uh, police forces and an NHS and a school system and no there was nothing like that I mean by and large the, the main government institutions around were the military and um, you know the, 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 the tax man and the, the revenue man so the most uh, you know uh, most the, the government served to um, uh, keep the army going you know you could look at it that way Keep the, the military forces going, keep the income coming into the, the government coffers. Right, I should probably pop a repair. So, yeah, things have changed a lot. And even the era in the era of Disraeli, it was still sort of slowly coming in. It was only kind of the late 19th century, the early 20th century, that uh, we started to get a lot more regulation, a lot more regularization. So you no longer had to worry about buying a bag of flour and finding that it was adulterated with, like, talcum. Or buying stuff that had lead in it, or, you know, all kinds of horrible, nasty, noxious things. 
so yeah it was an interesting era anyway I, I just completely went off at a tangent there but extra credits it's quite an interesting channel and you should probably subscribe to it if you have an interest in history even if you don't care about the other stuff the the gaming stuff that they talk about right this guy's sinking yeah the last time I had to walk into the Houses of Parliament with honest intentions was Guy Fawkes I like that I do like that I actually, I mean, Chaser, you actually, like, we effectively don't have much more than a three-party system in the UK. Although, there, it, it, well, it's it's kind of, you could argue it's a four-party at the moment, but it really is, it, it, there's always, like, two, for a very long time anyway, we're talking, uh, probably going back to around the Second World War, if not before, but, um, there's always been, for a long time anyway, sort of two main parties and then a more minor third party with a still reasonable representation. And in recent times, of course, that's been the Liberals, aka the Liberal Democrats, as they are now are. Um, but, uh, of course, now in Parliament, it's actually the SNP, Scottish National Party, who are effectively the third party in Parliament. And the Libs still have uh, a presence, but um, it's... It's uh, pretty... Uh, yeah, they, they really did get hammered in the last election, unfortunately. So, yeah. But over the issue of Europe in particular, I could see the Tory party, because uh, we've got a whole bunch of stuff relating to the European Union at the moment. Um, it would be kind of funny to see the European uh, split uh, in, in the Tory party just crack the entire party wide open. Because it could happen. Oh, also, the guy kind of... Um, never mind. I apparently didn't drag the guy in because I clicked go into battle too early or something. So, rip. Whoops. Right, I'm going to sail back to port. We're going to then log out the game. And I am going to go and try and record some video stuff and have lunch. And, oh, well, wanting to sail back to port, that takes me almost directly upwind, or downwind, no, upwind, yes, that which is a bit annoying, but oh. Anyway. Well, you see, I mean, there is some argument for not having too many parties. I mean, you look at, for instance, the EU Parliament, and, uh, of course, the nature of the EU Parliament is that it, it's representatives of, of um, different parties from all kinds of, of you know all, all the different countries of Europe so they've aligned into these various um, blocks based on ideology and it kind of works for an institution like that but then at the other extreme example you have Belgium where nobody can agree to work together and there's a lot of language and, and history po politics going into the particular situation in Belgium but uh, it, it's yeah too many too many um, sort of small parties and you end up with lots of weak easily bought down governments that rely on coalitions to survive essentially there was even some talk of in the uh the last uh election uh or was it the 2010 election it might have been of labor forming a minority government with the aid of the lib dems um, which, you know, but but in the end it, it's uh, it's a bit funny in the UK and they sometimes have to explain all these things um, that, that it's, it's not automatically the party with the most members of parliament like if they have a, an outright majority in parliament then okay they basically have you know, that, that's then in a position to form the next government no problem but if you have a situation where not enough people, uh, not enough, um, uh, there's not enough members uh, of uh, parliament for any given party to form an outright majority, then it, it basically, it's it kind of ends up with a situation where you have to have, um, it, it's sort of like the, the one with the most members gets a go, 
at forming a government, and if they can't form a government, then the next party gets to go at forming a government, and so on and so forth. So you could potentially have uh, the kind of situation that happened in Belgium, happening in Britain, where uh, there's kind of effectively no elected government, that you end up with a caretaker administration. But uh, it would be unlikely. And that's where the presence of the minor third party, in this case uh, the SNP, kind of comes into play. Potentially. So, yeah, whenever the next general is, that's going to be really interesting. Yeah, that's always seemed to me a bit like the presidential elections are so completely separate from uh, Senate and Congress. And you can have... Uh, basically, like Obama has had, you can have... Uh, a, one of your or both of your chambers dominated by one party with a president of the other party and you just end up with um, this complete stymie this this utter deadlock happening and it seems remarkable that Obama's even managed to do as much as he has given uh, the you know uphill battle he's just having to be constantly fighting right so we are safely in port we're actually almost at uh, junior lieutenant which is fine healthy amount of gold um, exit game there we go as we're in port we can just do that and I'll put up the togs and we'll we'll have some shanties to play things out but yes uh, this has been rather fun I've gotten a good way up to being the next rank which means potentially I can have more crew which is nice which means bigger ships but um, yeah it's uh, it's a thing we'll be doing again, I think, naval action. It actually works all right for the stream. I get to ramble on about everything. It's it's brilliant. I just get to let my mouth wander off on its own, and I can then talk about nuclear power and renewables and fusion generation and stellarators and the state of British politics and Robert Walpole and just anything else that my brain decides to jump to, which I don't know if it's entertaining for everyone else, but there's enough of you watching that I guess it must be. So hopefully you've enjoyed all this, and uh, if you have enjoyed my ramblings, uh, you can obviously follow on Twitch if you haven't already. Although if you're here, you probably have. Although we've had a couple of follows during the course of the stream. You can also find my YouTube channel below. There's Twitter, Facebook, etc. I think even my Patreon page is listed below as well. And um, yeah, I, I hopefully, hopefully will be not be back on stream again today because I really hope to get a video done. In fact, I even hope to record some CK2 today as well. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully that will work. And actually, I should put the video out soon. Today's video as well. I should remember to do that before I do anything else. So um, I guess, I guess, have a cool rest of the day wherever you are. And um, I will try and stream again at some point later this week as well. I kind of let it go by the wayside a bit but I suppose I should at least try for two or three times a week because it is fun it's just finding the time to do it so have a good day wherever you are and uh, I shall see you next time I do this